Hi there. My name is Kyle Law, and I will be your instructor for this course. I am a fifth year social psychology PhD student at University at Albany. Um, so let's get started. Um, so for this lecture, I will be covering um, an introduction to the structure of the course, as well as some information covered in chapter one. Um, so I'll start out with a course overview um, and start talking about things that you should probably do um, as soon as possible if you haven't already done so. Um, number one here is to read the syllabus and course calendar. Now these are posted on the course page. Um, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me over email. You can find my email address in the syllabus. Um, number two is to get textbook access um, and uh, access to my stat lab immediately. Um, and this is available through the bookstore as a bundle and we were able to find a, a low cost option. Um, number three is to download Jamovi. So Jamovi is a free or open source statistical analysis software package um, that you can download online and use um, for free. Um, and there are detailed instructions on how to do so in the syllabus. We're going to be using this later on in the course, um, but it's good to just have it installed on your machine now. And number four, um, make sure you have some access to a spreadsheet program. Now, um, Microsoft Excel is probably the best example of one of these, um, but Google Sheets and LibreOffice are offered for free online. So if you don't have in, uh, Excel installed on your machine, um, use Google Sheets or download LibreOffice for free. Now, um, in terms of course format, um, this is how a typical week in this course will be structured. So I will post online two sets of lecture slides. Um, and I will also post video accompaniment like this video here for each set of lecture slides. Um, and also I'll set up a, uh, I'll post a set of Kahoot questions for each chapter. So Kahoot is an online quizzing um, slash polling tool that I've used in my courses before and students find it very helpful. Now these question sets are simply to help you practice. They're not gonna be graded, um, but questions that appear on these question sets will likely show up on quizzes that are graded down the road and even on the final exam. So to access Kahoot, visit kahoot.com and make a free account. Um, and then second, search for my account. My handle is KFLawAlbany, so K-F-L-A-W-A-L-B-A-N-Y. Um, and then find the uh, Kahoot question set that pertains to the chapter covered in class. And I will generally post the name of the corresponding question set in the second set of lecture slides each week. Um, and during some class weeks, keep in mind that you will need to complete online quizzes or homework assignments, which will be indeed graded. Now, in terms of grading, 25% um, of your grade will be these homework assignments, which will be conducted through uh, my stat lab. So please get access to this as soon as possible. Um, now, the first assignment is a few weeks off, but it's good to have this up and running um, before um, that, that comes up. Now these assignments will consist of mostly multiple choice questions. And since you have multiple homework assignments, your lowest score will be dropped. I'm just gonna pause one second for this fire truck to pass. Now quizzes uh, will be the bulk majority of your grade, 50%. Um, they will be held online and they'll consist of mostly multiple choice questions. And again, your lowest score on quizzes will be dropped. Um, and I'll give you a large window of time prior to the due date to complete these quizzes. And you'll also have a long duration of time once you start the quiz to complete them. Um, and by long, I mean probably more than three hours, possibly unlimited amount of time, as long as they're in before the due date. And you'll have generally um, three or so days to, to complete the quiz. Now the final exam um, will be held in a similar structure to quizzes online and it will also consist of multiple choice questions. And for this as well, I will give you a large window of time to, to complete the exam. So in order to succeed in this course, there are a few things you need to do. Um, so I've structured it in a way that encourages it, uh, you to 
be doing a little bit on a regular basis rather than just cramming for quizzes and exams the night before. Um, in order to, to successfully carry this out, you'll need to keep up to date with the readings by following along in the class calendar. Um, and your first line of defense, if you're struggling with a topic, should always be to reread the relevant section of the textbook. Um, and uh, on many weeks, a homework assignment will be due or a quiz will be given, so it's important to stay on top of this course calendar for due dates as well. Um, and I recommend setting Google Calendar alerts now, just so that you have something to ping you every time something is going to be coming up. Um, I'll also remind you at the end of each class about upcoming assignments and due dates um, and when there are going to be changes to these due dates. Um, and this is going to be rare, um, but it could happen just given the nature of um, this semester being amidst a global pandemic. So this course is different from other courses um, in that the material is largely cumulative with later topics building on earlier topics. So if you're stuck on something early on, um, it's not in your favor to assume that you could just ignore it and do better on later material because this later material may rely to a large extent on what you already are struggling with. Um, so if you do find yourself struggling, there are resources available to you. For example, office hours, always feel free to, to schedule a Zoom meeting with me. Um, also, my stat lab practice problems um, are a good way to, to drill yourself on material that you're, that you're struggling with. And the Kahoot question sets will most closely resemble the way you're going to be evaluated on quizzes and the final exam. So this is always a good way to, to study um, and work out issues that you're having um, with particular content areas. Now, I also highly encourage you to utilize outside resources that could be found online. Um, so there are a lot of YouTube videos that cover different topics that uh, we talk about in the statistics course and in statistics more broadly. So take advantage of channels like Crash Course Statistics, and you can find a link to um, this channel below. Um, so now getting into content a little bit, um, why is it important to learn statistics? So from an academic perspective, it's going to be crucial to be able to read and understand the social science literature. So research in social sciences, um, including sociology, psychology, um, et cetera, often rely upon empirical data and the use of statistics to analyze these sets of data. Um, and when you're conducting your own research, you're going to need to know how to perform basic and even some more complex statistical analyses. Um, so, of course, there is an application to what you're going to be learning in this class for other classes that you're going to have and other um, research related engagements you involve yourself with throughout your academic career. Um, but it's also important for general pers uh, purposes. So if you're actively engaged with this course, um, you're going to improve your reasoning and become savvier um, at consuming information. Um, it will help you be more critical of information that you read or hear on the news. Um, and not having at least some background in statistics limits your ability to critically examine and weigh scientific evidence that relies upon it. Um, so this will come in handy when you're presented with scientific papers or news articles um, to have some basis to understand the statistical analyses that are being presented here and actually critically um, engage with them and critique the findings that are being presented in news sources or in, in scientific journals. So what is a statistic? Um, it's a general term for any number that describes some aspect of a data set. I mean, it generally comes in one of two flavors, descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. Now, descriptive statistics are used to summarize and describe only the data that we've actually collected or observed. So, for example, recording the height of every person in this class and reporting the class average for height. Now, inferential statistics, on the other hand, are used to draw conclusions from the data we collected about larger populations than the ones we actually studied. So, 
all college students, all males, or all humans. So an example of this would be using our sample average, so the average height of the students in this class, to infer something about the broader population of interest, so the height of all college students. So if we are trying to describe this population average, we are getting into the realm of inferential statistics because we are inferring something about the population from the data that we've collected in a smaller sample from that population. Now, sometimes people use these two varieties of statistics in ways that overlap. So for example, according to the uh, CDC, the average height for an adult male over age 20 in the United States is 69.2 inches or roughly five feet, nine inches. Now, while strictly speaking, this is only a descriptive stat, so describing only those individuals that were actually measured in this study, it came from a very large data set of over 20,000, or rather, roughly 20,000 people. Um, so since this data set is so large, it's probably a pretty good estimate of the true value in that population and is reported more like an inferential statistic describing the entire population of US males over age 20. So when statistics are used appropriately, they're able to give us the ability to get to the truth of some matter by going beyond the limitations of our individual experience. Now a key theme throughout this course is that the more data we collect, so the more individuals that we measure and study, the closer our sample statistics will be to the true value in the population. So with larger samples, we are essentially getting closer to the truth. And social scientists generally attempt to answer questions about human beings by collecting data from samples of individuals that are large and representative of the overall population so that we are able to make inferential generalizations from our samples about these larger populations. Now, in this course, three terms you're gonna hear a lot about are variables, values, and scores. So a variable is simply an attribute or a characteristic or trait that can be measured in some way and can take a range of possible values. So a good example of a variable is IQ or the intelligence quotient. Now a value is any specific number that a variable could hypothetically take on. So for example, IQ could take on values of 89, 130, 102, et cetera. Now the difference between a value and a score is that a score is one person's value on a given variable. So for example, Alyssa's IQ is 115. So when I use the term data or data, I am typically referring to a set of individual scores on a collection of variables of interest. Now in this class, we're generally going to organize our data to look something like this. So we have a, a spreadsheet here and it has rows going horizontally and columns going vertically. Rows are given letter coordinates, or rather columns are given letter coordinates while rows are given numbered coordinates. Now these rows, these horizontal lines here represent individuals or whatever entities are being measured. So it could be nations, schools, or corporations, while these columns represent variables. Now each cell, so each individual box here, or a row and column combination, represents a score or a data point. So in cell B5, so read from B all the way down to row five, this represents subject fours extraversion score, which is two, right? So each individual cell here is a score. <clears throat> now you're gonna come across a number of types of variables when you engage in this course and when you read scientific papers going forward. 
um, and these types of variables, also called levels of measurement, um, are as follows. So for one, we have quantitative or numeric variables. And under this category, we have equal interval variables. So on an equal interval variable, difference between, differences between scale points reflect equivalent amounts of the thing being measured across the entire scale. So in other words, if the difference between a one and a two is equivalent to the difference between a 51 or and a 52 or a 99 and 100, this is an equal interval variable. So an example of an equal interval variable is dollars in your wallet right now. The difference between one and $2 is equivalent to the difference between uh, 50 and $51. Also, the temperature on a thermometer or seconds on a clock are equal interval variables. Now, ratio scale variables are a subset of equal interval, interval variables that uh, have a true zero. So if you can conceive of an absence of whatever is being measured um, and whatever is being measured is an equal interval, then it is a ratio scale variable. So an example of this would be the number of siblings you might have or miles per hour. So another type of quantitative or numeric variable is an ordinal variable. So on an ordinal variable, the distance between scale points is not necessarily equivalent along the scale, but at least the order is maintained for whatever is being measured. That is to say, five is definitely more than a four, but the distance between five and four might not be the same as that which is between a one and a two. So an example of an ordinal variable is class rank or a Likert score, seen to the right here. So one equals strongly disagree to five equals strongly agree. Now, in addition to quantitative and numeric variables, we'll also deal in the realm of qualitative and non-numeric variables. For example, categorical variables or values that represent distinct categories not representative of a specific quantity of anything. So for example, gender or religion. In, in surveys, we might assign numbers to different genders or different religions. But these, these numbers don't refer to any quantity. It's simply referring to a separate category. Now, another way to classify equal interval variables, which was the first type of quantitative or numeric variable we talked about, um, is into the categories of discrete uh, and continuous variables. Now, discrete variables have a limited number of values they can take on. So, for example, the value um, obtained by rolling a dice, there are six values that can possibly be rolled, but they are still numeric and they are equal interval. Um, and the other category is continuous variables. So, continuous variables have an infinite number of possible values in between any two given values, depending on how many decimal places you want to go. So, an example of this would be height or age. So, another example of a discrete variable would be how many pets do you have? Um, because you can't have half of a pet. Um, and another continuous variable might be how much do you weigh? You could weigh uh, 150.3 pounds um, or 150 even. So if you can conceive of expressing the particular variable as a decimal, um, you are dealing with a continuous variable. So why do these distinctions matter? Well, because there are different kinds of variables and each one requires different kinds of statistical techniques. Now, most of this class will be centered around equal interval variables or variables that researchers deem close enough to treat as equal interval. So for example, how would you rate your current life satisfaction from one extremely dissatisfied to seven extremely satisfied? Now you can call into the question whether or not the distance between a six or a seven on the scale is the same as the difference between a one or a two. Um, but generally speaking, um, from the perspective of researchers, these variables are treated as if they, these are equal interval, even though they might not actually be. Now that is um, the break point for this lecture. Um, and I will be recording a separate 
um, video for uh, lecture two slides, which will be also corresponding to chapter one. Um, and in that lecture, we'll talk about um, how do we display data in, in graphs and in tables.